Alright, hey guys, so today on Beak House Sport, we are here for another week of In the Sheds. I'm very excited for this one. We have got Rugby League Royalty with us, and it's going to be a fantastic conversation. I'm very excited to talk everything league, and you know, he has his own podcast as well, so he's, he's definitely knowledgeable on all things sport. First off, guys, obviously, we're going to have to introduce the two guys that you're well aware of, uh, Luke, who is Shirls, and Hayden, who is Entertain House. Welcome, boys. Another day, another podcast, Blaze. <laughs> Getting pretty excited for this one. <laughs> pretty damn excited. Yeah. Like you, boys. Yeah, well, look, I've, I've obviously grown up my, my life being a massive rugby league fan, and, and you know, this uh, our guest today is uh, a, a, a player who's, who's, who's done it all. He's, he's won a premiership, and uh, he's played state level for New South Wales. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty incredible. So today, guys, we're going to be having our guest on for the first NRL star of In The Sheds. And this isn't just any NRL star. Like I said, this is absolute rugby league royalty. He made his name with the St. George Illawarra Dragons, winning a premiership with the club in the process. And our guest has also played for the Sydney Roosters, Penrith Panthers, and in the Super League for the London Broncos. He's, he's gone on to become a commentator in the game since his retirement in 2016. And now he hosts the Sweet and Soured podcast that delves into everything sport, Australian sport, and America sport it's just basically everything you want to know in regards to sport it's, it's bloody fantastic you better check it out obviously guys we've got none other than the big fella jamie salad let's welcome him boys Woo! yeah <laughs> how about that for a bit of a welcome mate <laughs> I like how you said big fella. I'm a lot bigger than what I was playing. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, you're, you're good, mate. You're, um, you, you bloody ran around the field like you. I know you're, you're not exactly the tallest bloke, but you, you, you made sure that people knew you were there. Yeah, it's um, looking back. Actually, I saw a game the other day in 2014. Uh, uh, my wife walked in and. And she looked at me now and looked at me back then and she's like, how did you ever play against those big guys? <laughs> uh, but no, nah, yeah, it's, uh, I was pretty lucky to have uh, the career I had, which was good. Did you ever know yeah. the other team were targeting you just to run at you? They put a big prop forward on you and how did you kind of handle that? Because I've always wondered that as well. Like Jonathan Thurston's another person that they would target with big forwards. How did you kind of handle that aspect? Of rugby league uh yeah it's, it's a good question i don't get asked it too often but i think every half back or half gets targeted because of their um you know size and everything like that yeah. but mine was probably my my defensive lapses uh, i wasn't the strongest defender so i knew i was going to get plenty of work uh every game whether it be you know spot player or uh that's what they call it. they try and work towards that spot player and sometimes you can get carried away with spot players and you're making sure that all your traffic's directed there. So after you think you've, it's not a straight up and down tackle one-on-one. -on -one. It's, you know, you've got angles coming out, you've got people with footwork, you've got players out the back. So uh, not necessarily that one-on-one -on -one contest. If it was all one-on-one, -on -one, I think you'd find most halfbacks to be able to de defend and, and handle it. But yeah. it's when you get that shape as well after the, you know, five, six times tackling. So that's why I moved closer out to the wing and uh, was was lucky enough to have a couple of protectors in my career. Yeah, that's fantastic, mate. You, you Obviously, you, you had a, a fantastic career. And like we said, you know, um, you really, you face it first and you, and you came through it. So I'm very excited to get into your career, you know, when you won the premiership in 2010 with the Dragons. Even though I'm a Titans fan, mate, so that was the only year the Titans, you know, had a relative, even the remotest of chances of winning the premiership. I'm being real, Blaze. It's the oh, only year. On, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he took my premiership from me. He took it. He took it. But no, look. Let's um, before we get into all that. I, I, obviously, you know, you're you're an NBL fan. Uh, we we all see you as a, a massive Sydney Kings fan. How do you how do you feel about how that that season ended, mate? Obviously, you know, with everything going on, they had to they had to can it. And how do you feel about the result? Yeah, look, I think yeah, you know, when you look back at where the Kings have been the last couple of years versus where they were this year, it obviously wasn't the end result. But no one could see what was going to happen in the world. The new ownership of Paul Smith, CEO Chris Pongrass, you know, Paul White working there. They're all working behind the scenes to make the Sydney Kings not only the number one team in the NBL, but one of the number one products in Australian sports. So, uh, you know, being working with them for a couple of years now uh, and being lucky enough to be able to work with them, I'm seeing the, the steps forward they've been able to take. Now, on the court, that needs to translate to wins. And they understand that more than most with their salary cap and, you know the players they bought this year so it was disappointing that they didn't get the uh, the title at the end but i think you know where it was three years ago before andrew bogut came back into the nbl the nbl wasn't on the map you know he comes back a championship winner yeah. 
comes back to the Sydney Kings. The Sydney Kings are relevant, and I think they're. It's not a flash in the pan for the Sydney Kings. They're going to be relevant for a long time now. Yeah, I, I agree. I was I was there. I was actually doing some stuff at Sydney Kings as well in regards to uh, vlogging um, at the game, and I was there for game one. And uh, you know, you can definitely see the improvements in the in the NBL as a, as a general product. Um, and the Sydney Kings over the last few years, like before, I'd, I'd nearly say before 2016, 2015, it really wasn't a big sport whatsoever. It was just kind of, it was just there. But now with, you know, the inclusion of Andrew Bogan, as you said, it's, it's really um, brought the game back up. And as we saw Sydney Kings, uh, they did end up winning the, the regular season, uh, but they didn't get the cookies in the end. Do you feel like that was a fair result based off the circumstances to give the uh, Perth, Perth, to give Perth the, the championship? No. There should have been no title. That was that was a bullshit Agreed. decision um, by by the powers that be. After it wasn't like you know the the Sydney Kings they would have had to go over there and play and may not be able to come back to their families. You know there was so many what ifs when that situation. We got to think we're looking at it now and and we're down the track and we know a little bit more about yeah. the quarantining, the, the social distancing, all that kind of stuff. A month ago, six weeks ago, we had no idea what was going on and we we're asking players to travel across country, different environments, you know, potentially put others in, in danger uh, during and, and then ask him to play in a grand final series. So, yeah, I think that was a, the wrong decision. Uh, I know Perth fans and everyone will say, you know, they were 2-1 up. It's, it's easy just to vacate the title. We've seen competitions in rugby league now, the reserve grade this year for New South Wales and Queensland. There's going to be no winner. We're looking at potentially the NBA having no winner this year in the 2019 season. It's mental. Uh, But the NBL went out and awarded it to a team that was 2-1 up in a series after, you know, both teams had lost on their home court. So uh, I think that was, uh, yeah, I I agree. It should have been uh, no title. Yeah, NBL. Do you think NBL is getting bigger because these Andrew Bogut people coming back from the NBA and like LaMelo obviously coming down to the Hawks and stuff? Do you think that is what, the NBL needs to grow. We need these kind of marquee people to come and make it big because there are a lot of people that love basketball in Australia. Yeah, well, it's the NBA right now is you can go and watch a game in two hours and be in the car, you know, and and nearly home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. Of yeah. Sports don't have that, you know, I guess appealing factor where something happens every twenty seconds, and that's why my wife loves it. She'd never seen a game of basketball. When we met five years ago, now she's an avid you know, Celtics and uh, Kings fan off the basis that she loves that something happens every 24 seconds. And that's the appeal of basketball. Uh, the talent has gotten stronger. Uh, clubs are starting to recruit smarter. Instead of just bringing out retired NBA guys looking for a gig or yep. you know, European players who have been part of systems to bring them out to play, they're actually doing their research. Look at Cairns Taipans this year. You know, they've, they've been really bad the last couple of years they go out and recruit three guys in three certain positions and the recruits the the imports need to be starters you don't bring imports over here to be bench players and i think that's where teams have gotten it wrong in the past including the sydney kings our recruitment up before last year or this year has been poor in in those areas and that's why they have struggled so uh, if you if you're looking at the nba you're not looking at the NBL and thinking I'm going over there to get paid now you're coming over here as a stepping stone to go back to the NBA and that's what young college guys are doing to be able to come out to grow their brand and then they go back to the NBA that's the end goal whereas I think you know five years ago ten years ago the NBL wasn't an option and just recently the NBL was more like a go and get paid and now it's actually a stepping stone back to the NBA. Lamelo came over, obviously, and uh, he went to Illawarra. And before he came over, I believe he was actually tied to be a little bit lower in the draft, but now he's predicted to be a top five draft pick. So obviously coming down to the NBL, it's like it's not really coming down anymore. It's, it's giving you, like you said, that stepping stone, that pathway. Then uh, he's obviously improved his game so much, and, and then he's yeah, he's going back, and uh, he's got a, a high draft pick potentially. Yeah, look, Lamelo's probably a unique situation that he's everyone knows about him from YouTube and you know all these his family, yeah. Seen, you know, so a lot of the guys that we haven't heard about in the draft coming up, we've we haven't seen them at all because there's no college season. So um, I think that yeah, you know, Lamelo using it to come down and play against men, and, and that's you know talking about my career. My two years in reserve grade held me in great stead to be able to play against men for the next 10 years because if you have that under-20s mentality which the NRL had in the past, the conversion rate's not that high because they're not used to doing it week in, week out against men. And in the NBA, you have to do it night in, night out. So 
Uh, like you said, the NBL is a stepping stone to go back to the NBA or get into the NBA, not just a paycheck. Do you think yeah, with players like Bogut, Plumley, things like that, going from NBA to NBL over the years, and to add on Luke's question, kind of, you mentioned that you've been there for a couple of years now. From your point of view, has the NBL been evolving based on those facts? Is that why more crowds turn up, or do you think it's just becoming? Uh, a popular sport now. Yeah, a bit of both. I think it's it's easy to watch. You know, it's it's one of those sports that you know people often say uh, AFL can't watch it at the ground, but I can watch it on TV. Yeah. Um, you know, rugby league. Oh, yeah, you don't have to be there. You know, there's there's sports around the world. Golf. I'd rather go and watch golf at the at the course than on TV. Basketball is one of those sports you can watch on TV and and be in the crowd, and it can be similar. Uh, to what you see yeah. because you're always watching the same sort of thing there's no real off the ball stuff that you don't see on the tv so the product the nbl have got at the moment is it's f- family friendly uh it's family friendly times and you're in and out in two hours uh so that's why they're getting good crowd numbers and especially the kings they've done it right this year there's not not been too much bullshit in terms of you know the, the product is fans will go and support a team as long as they're winning yeah, and that's 100%. the end result and the, and the clubs around the world that get that twisted and want to market and, and do all that other crap aren't going to aren't going to get fans through because at the end of the day you go home with a smile on your face if your team wins and if they lose you, you're pissed off so that's that's the main thing you're judged on wins and losses in this life and uh, until that changes you know it's uh, it's going to be that's going to be the rule for everyone. Now, look, Jamie. I want to. Uh, I, I, I want to move back into into your career now. And obviously, you retired in 2016. What have you been focusing on since your retirement? I know a lot of people would be interested in, in seeing what you've uh, what you've been, you know, building towards after retiring from the game. Yeah, clearly eating. Um... <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I think everyone's eating life. at this stage. You know, we can't leave the house, so I feel like everyone's definitely eating. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, look, I, I, you know, I wasn't the greatest trainer, so in, in retirement, I don't really train too much at all. Uh, I enjoyed, you know, it's the thing about retirement is it's forever, and you know, there's no one really comes back from it. So I made the decision to retire, and you know, for about three months, I sort of just sat around on my ass and didn't really know what to do. Um, getting back into the workforce you know stuff like making your own lunch um you know reg, getting car rego yeah. done all that kind of stuff that was done you know for me the last 10 years through my career with player sponsorships and all that kind of stuff i had to learn over again so um i, I always wanted to work in the media i thought that i was pretty good at analyzing the game but also being able to take the piss out of myself which is important uh and then you know stuff like podcasts as well so for me, you know, working Channel 9, uh, got some good relationships there, NRL.com, New South Wales Rugby League, uh, and then 2GB just recently, you know, the biggest radio. rating network yeah. in, in terms of radio uh, in for rugby league and especially daytime radio as well. So I'm sort of in a good stable there. Um, you know, straight out of retirement, I actually sold toilets at Harvey Norman. Uh, people were confused as to why I wasn't at training. I had to tell them I'd retired. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's, I think, yeah, for me, I, I enjoy the content. I enjoy podcasts. I enjoy conversations with people, not necessarily teaching them too much and trying to preach about things, but just enjoying a conversation and maybe putting ideas and hearing ideas and trying to put that together. And that's how my podcast came about. Um, you know, I met a guy who I wanted to, you know, who, who said he could help with some sponsorships and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, I got six other guys that want to help out. And now we we get every get together every Tuesday and talk shit and, and put out a podcast. So uh, that that kind of stuff, the whole content stuff at the moment is king. But yeah, you know, in terms of retirement, I've worked really hard on my craft in my you know, what I do and how I present myself and how I look at the game. And you know, it's not going to please everyone all the time. But uh, I wasn't put on this you know earth to please everyone all the time. I was one of those guys that was made to make to, to play the villain. One thing I love, Jamie, is and I want to know. My question is to you: How much do you, analysm goes into so you do the on the nrl site you do the power rankings which i love watching every week seeing the teams develop and look it could be just you watch the match you rank but i think there's a bit more to it is there a lot of analysm that goes into that because that's something that you'd be doing after your career you'd be analyzing the games because it looks like yeah yeah look great question and this is probably one of my yeah, pet projects that I'd like to think I'm the best at power rankings because I base them off a lot of different circumstances and things that go into games. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. The, sitting down and watching eight games every weekend is impossible 
for every analyst. Um, you know, I may watch five, I may get six in, but sitting down, I think it's important to have a balance between life and, and work. So a power ranking for me is I sit down at the start of this. So let's do 2020. At the end of 2019, I have the ladder where everyone finished. And then I sit down and I go, right, where, who finished the year strong? Who was actually bringing some youngsters through? Right, okay, so I do another power ranking. This is before preseason starts. Then we sit down and do another power ranking once the squads come out. Then we do another power ranking. This is all before I actually publish the first power ranking on, on the season. Yeah. And people think I just sit there and throw darts at it and they can't understand. If I rank your team four, 16th, the Warriors this year, and they come out and win round one against the Roosters, who were number one, that doesn't mean that the Warriors are the best team in the competition. Then you sit down and you go, right, injuries, who do they play next week? How did they play? Did they get the team on an off night or did they actually play good? Can this trend continue or is this a flash in the pan? What else? Yeah, you know, there's like six, seven things that you look for every week and people just can't understand that because they see the American ones mm. and they just think that yeah. the, they just rate the best teams all the time. It's, it's a science that goes into it. I take pride in the power rankings because every Monday they come out. It's the biggest article on NRL.com every Monday because it creates so much uh, divide in opinion, but it is actually science. You can't go from 16 to 1 and then back to 16. It would just create chaos in the in the power rankings. So I hmm. uh, hope that clears it up. But I don't know if you can swear on this podcast, but I'm sick of trying to explain it to people that don't really want to understand. So, yeah, the power yeah. rankings is, is a pet project of mine that I love doing. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's that people don't understand. I feel it's people who just don't want to understand. They want to they want you to obviously put their team higher. I find that with the NFL, obviously, it is really based on the individual game and how that team is done in that specific game, and not involving all the statistics and analytics that you've just mentioned. It's, it it is very difficult and it's incredible that you've you've done all this this different. You put all these different processes in to get your power rankings. I find that people just don't want to understand, and that's and that's because they want their team to be looking better. They want you to be agreeing with how their team is doing in the process. Do you feel like that's probably, you feel like that's more the way? Yeah, well, I mean, when the Miami Dolphins beat the New England Patriots last year, they didn't go to the top of the power rankings, did they? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, look, I think that people, this, you know, people in Australia want everyone to be the guy that you want to have a beer with. And, you know, you have to be a good guy. You can't be, you can't be left of centre, you can't be right of centre. You have to be that person. And, the, the power rankings, you know, people blew up last year. I'll, I'll tell you a, a true story. Last year after I had the Warriors and Bulldogs uh, ranked similarly last year and the Warriors come out and got absolutely, they belted the Bulldogs 40 points to, to six or something like that. And I moved them yeah. up one spot and they're like, oh, I can't believe you. They're not number one. And I said, but the Bulldogs are ranked 14th. They beat the 14th yeah. ranked side in my opinion, in on my virtual ladder. They need to beat the one, two, three, four side to be at least in the top 10. You, you just can't make them to the top. So the ignorance, you're right, it, it, it happens. But yeah, I just think that people always want that person. You have to be a great guy. You can't have a difference of opinion because otherwise, you know, you're a wanker and you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I agree with you for that because I'm a Sharks fan and the Sharks always give Melbourne a really good uh, go for their money. But just because the Sharks beat Melbourne doesn't mean the Sharks are now in the top four. I would I would be surprised if the Sharks were in the top eight in the power rankings this year just because it's just so inconsistent. Yeah, they have great players. They have Fafida and, and stuff like that that can really win games. But just because they beat the Storm and then maybe Parramatta or something that are going pretty good doesn't mean they're in a top four side. So I know where you're well, coming from. People can never... Yeah. The Sharks last year, sorry to cut you off, the Sharks last year got a little bit of leeway because I knew that if they had a fin- they had a finals team that could put it with Wade Gray in there, eight, yeah. And they had that experience. So, you know, the the Sharks are like, What well, the Sharks lost on the weekend to Melbourne, how come you don't move them down? I'm like, Well they've got a game next week that they should win and yeah. they've got the experience to be able to go on a little bit of a run here. So you yeah. you've got to take all that into consideration and you know, like you said, the people don't want to understand, so it, it does make it hard but uh, lucky for me, I don't. I don't. I stopped reading comments a long, long time ago. Except on Twitter, I love Twitter. <laughs> love Twitter of all things. Jamie, I wanna, I wanna move into, you know, like I, like I said, 
I want to see what your thoughts are about you know players when they do leave the game. Obviously, we, we actually spoke with with Jesse Prahi of the Australian Sevens and Charlie Dixon of the AFL, where we said uh, we, we we wanted to know about the mental health of what's next after you finish. Obviously, you train and train and train your whole life to get to the peak performance of playing in the rugby league or playing in your professional sport, and then it comes to a time where you have to say goodbye. You said there was that three month period afterwards where you had to kind of readjust into the system. Did you have a did you have something that uh, that you knew you were going to do afterwards, or were you in this stage where you were like, "What do I do now?" Yeah, as I said, you know, selling the toilets. My wife got me a job. She works at Harvey Norman, so she got me a job doing that out at Penrith. I think the the hardest thing is, you know, it, for so long a routine had been structured into my lifestyle that I went from, you know, had to be there on a certain time, had to do this, had to wear this, had to eat this to no one's telling me what to do anymore and I've got to make decisions for myself. So, um, you know, some people continue to train, some people don't, some people, you know, go out and get a job. It took me a little bit longer, but uh, that whole routine is something that athletes will always crave. So for the mental health side of things, um, I'd come out a really difficult time through divorce and and stuff like that. So uh, that was like the retiring for me was like the the goodbye to an old life that I was ready to move on from, if that makes sense. I'm more happier now in retirement and with my family, with my wife and daughter, that I ever was playing league. And that people can't comprehend that. They're like, you're playing in front of thousands of people, you're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, all that kind of stuff. And yes, it was great. There was pressures, there was ups, there was downs, there was things I regret, there was all that kind of stuff that went into that part of life. But nothing translates to being able to look over at your wife and your daughter and enjoy that time and go to work and be happy all the time what you're doing regardless of what's going on in the outside world and and unfortunately during my career sometimes wasn't able to separate that what was going on in life versus what was going on in the field and if you mix those two together uh, it makes it hard in retirement so retirement for me has been a steady incline i'd like to think in, in you know boosting my profile being able to do uh, lots of things within the media and still working hard as well so uh, it is a hard adjustment, especially mentally, because you go from, you know, people wanting to to talk to you, autographs, give you things, everything like that, to how am I going to get paid? How am I going to pay the rent next week? How am I going to do all that yeah. kind of stuff? So it's a mental transition. Uh, does the game do enough? Does do organisations do enough? I don't think they do enough. I think that it's it has to be, you know, that the top end guys certainly get looked after a lot, but a lot, you know, ninety nine percent of people sort of just gets it retirement and they move on and, and not everyone has saved or, or used their time as wisely as other people so uh, athletes are starting to catch up to that now but it certainly is a, a hard transition yeah that's that's the thing that's what we're talking about as well like it is it is the, the hard transition but uh, but I think they are like you just said just now that, that they are starting to implement a lot more because of the, the realisation a, a, a while back where it, was, it wasn't kind of a major thing but now I think people are starting to realise like yeah, we do need to save our money. And I feel like this situation right now will highlight that as well because there's a lot of uncertainty around the future. There's a lot of uncertainty around the future. So I feel like this situation will really highlight you need to know kind of post and you need to have that somewhat set up uh, for when your career does come to an end, obviously. Yeah, you're, you're 100% right. I think the young kids that are getting you know, well paid at the moment, this is going to be a wake up call if they weren't already starting to plan for the future that they do need to because it could all be gone tomorrow. And you say that as a person to yourself, like, oh, what if this all ended tomorrow? Would you be all right? And you're like, yeah, I'd be all right. And that actually happens. And you're like, oh, shit, uh, maybe I'm not as prepared as what I, what I needed to be. So luckily for, for myself, you know, I was able to get out of the game with a little bit and you know work on uh, what's next with my with my wife now now moving on into the the uncertainty of how the nrl plans to continue uh may 28th we've been given a date do do you think this will work out yeah well the the nrl needed to come when you're trying to work back to something it's like when you're coming back from injury if you if i just said to you you're injured you're out for 12 months you don't have a return date that plays on your mind mentally. And how do you get 500 players ready to go in two weeks if you don't give them a date to at least look forward to? So what the NRL has done now is they've put a date on the board that clubs and players can start organising things around 
you know, I guess preempting what might happen in terms of family, travel, all that kind of stuff to get themselves prepared. Now, if it doesn't go ahead and it is pushed back a week or something happens and they have to change on the run, at least in the players' minds, they know that they've got six weeks here before they start, you know, potentially start getting back and into quarantine and stuff. So it was important the NRL did that. They've got a lot of hurdles to jump to be able to get the game to, to back to where, you know, back on the field. But it was important that they came out with a date just so that everyone could start getting their heads around it and start getting, I guess, positive again about the game being back on the field. Yeah, well, I know, especially on my behalf, and I know I can speak for a lot here, obviously, a lot of people are lost without the game right now. No one really knows kind of what, like, in regards to sport in general. And it was obviously a very positive day for rugby league when we when we heard that it was coming back. I know, I know it's a, it's a good thing for positivity and getting people back in the thought process of this is coming, you know, start preparing. But do you feel like, you know, it could be more of a, you know, we're, we're, we're trying here, more of a we're trying rather than it's actually going to happen? I think it'll happen. I've been confident, pretty confident all along that the, the season will get back underway. And like I said, you know, they've put together the smartest minds, some of the smartest minds in the NRL to get this product back on the field. Now, this is not to say that it's not a you know, changing moment. This, this, what we're going through at the moment changes second by second. So, you know, it, the pin could be pulled you know, by, while we're recording this. We don't know. But it was important to have a date to be able to strive towards so that everyone could start getting prepared. Do you feel as long as the leagues clubs like Penrith Leagues, Canterbury Bank Sounds Leagues Club, until those are really, I don't know, everyone's back at work at those kind of places that really push their clubs forward financially, that it's going to be very difficult for the clubs to be earning and generating money without those big kind of uh, entities backing them? Oh, I don't think we're under any, um, you know, I guess we're not surprised that the game's never going to be like it was now. Yeah. It's, you know, the the $13 million grants aren't going to be happening, you know, in, in the future. It's going to take a while. It's not going to be, it's not just going to bounce back to work and everything's going to be fine again. So everyone's sure. going to have to be patient in terms of that. And I think you start with the players and the product first and then you work back from there because I'm out of a job at the moment uh, working at NRL.com. There's nothing for me to cover. So I was let go uh, and, and haven't got that you know, financially um, sorted out yet and not no guarantee to be able to go back to that work because of all the cuts to get the game back. So, like I said, it's important that the game is back first. The Leagues Club and everything like that, we're under no um, illusions that the Leagues Club's going to be able to open tomorrow and people are going to be able to go and pump money back into it because, mm. one, um, no one's going to have any money to do that and we have yep. to be careful of that when we do get the game back, that we're not offering memberships that are hiked up to try and recruit all that money. We need to try and get fans through you know ten dollar tickets for for two years let's try and get thirty thousand through let's try and get people appreciating the fact that we can go to a game because i don't really uh i don't think people realize how um how much players love having full stadiums and maybe this wakes you know that that sort of sleeping giant of getting people to the game but yeah, it's going to be a long process. It's not going to happen overnight. We've definitely seen that it's highlighted the, the, the impact of the fans of the game. We've, we've definitely seen that, obviously, with the first two rounds being played. Well, the first round was different. There was fans there. Uh, but the second round, I feel like, has definitely highlighted the impact of the fans of, of, of the, uh, the atmosphere on the game. Uh, a lot of people, obviously, discredited it a little bit and thought it was more so you know, ex- only what was happening on the field. But I feel like after seeing that second round, we, we've really seen... Um, how much an atmosphere can can impact the, the playing of the game. Yes, yes and no. I mean, all that rubbish about, you know, you, you want fans there, but I've played reserve grade in front of 10, 15 people. So. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, fair enough. Being able to play there. So, look, I think that the main thing is the players want to be paid. You know, a lot of people will rely on rugby league on and off the field uh, to be able to, provide for their families, but also have that escape from whatever they're dealing with. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a tough one. But the, the no fans thing, I think, is going to just seem normal to us because the only solace that we have is it's happening worldwide. You know, we have a chance right now yeah. to put the product back on the field if we can May 28th with no other major sporting, you know, organisation being able to do that, including NBA, potentially NFL. I mean, yeah. American sports yeah. has gone to a, a complete halt at the moment. And we can lead the way by showing that we can get the job done with these players and maybe be 
and, and provide a solution to the NFL if it, if it gets underway. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see it come to fruition. I'm very excited. I, I'm lost throughout the weekends. I'm lost without my Friday night footy, and uh, it's, it's definitely something that I, I, I really look forward to. And I, I, I truly hope that, uh, that it does get underway, like you're saying, and I really hope for the best because we all know the game needs to be back. And, uh, and like you just said, there, there is no other sports on right now besides Belarusian football. Uh, so it's like, you know, everyone's, you know, everyone's desperate, to see, uh, just desperate to see some rugby league action. Um, now, I, I want to get more into your career now, Jamie. I want to uh, ask you specifically about, you know, what was the Kickstarter of your career? Obviously, you, you're from Canberra. You, you went through the, um, the Canberra youth system, I believe. Uh, and then obviously went to Sydney Roosters, Jersey Flag. What do you feel like was the, the Kickstarter for your career? Yeah, um, I have to give you a rap because most people think I'm born in Wagga, but yeah, I am born in Canberra. Um, yeah, I think uh, living in Wagga, playing you know, footy there at, at Wagga Kangaroos, certainly some really good times. But probably the, the one moment that kickstarted it was definitely uh, Wayne Bennett you know, calling me through 08. I'd sort of started in and out of first grade at the Roosters after having a successful junior career and I think you know three grand finals in a row with under 20s and then two reserve grade ones and um, you know I was re- I was thought I was ready to make the step but it just sort of took a little bit longer so Wayne coming to the club in 09 and, and giving me that confidence to be able to go out there and back myself I have you know no doubts that yeah, him being a part of my footy career and my life really uh, turned it around between 09 and 11 so uh, it's it's tough at times but um, that one moment was probably 08. I was in bed and uh, I thought we were going to get Wayne at the Roosters at 06 and he reneged on the deal because it, it got made public. So, uh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he was going for the Roosters and it came out. I think he'd agree with Nick Politis and someone leaked it to the paper and then he reneged on the, on the next day. So I was filthy uh, that I didn't yeah, get any yeah, on him. But... Um, Oh wait, he calls me. I'm in bed. I sprint out to the lounge room. I instantly start dripping, um, dripping sweat because I was nervous. And uh, it was just, a, it was a conversation. He just said, "I want you to be my five eight uh, for next year, and just good luck for the rest of the year. Make sure you're trying to enjoy your footy." And you know, oh wait was tough at the Dragons. Oh seven was tough. Oh eight was tough. We finished, um, I think we finished seventh and, and didn't get to play in that prelim final. But uh, yeah, it was once he came to the club, it was completely different. That's that's uh, Wayne Bennett is is literally a. He, he's, w- would you classify him? Obviously, there is Craig Bellamy as well, and this is you may feel a little bit biased on this, but do you feel like Wayne Bennett's the best coach of all time, or, or what's your thoughts on that? Well, I have no doubt that you know Craig has been doing it for a long time now. Yeah, you know, Wayne's been doing it for a long time. Trent Robinson's certainly the best coach in the game at the moment. Wayne's. You're the greatest of all time because of his longevity. You think that first grand final, 89, to be able to make a grand final in 2015, all those years he's been able to... I think at one stage there, his Broncos record was you know, one title every three years. That was just ridiculous. Well, up until 2015, just quickly, up until 2015 when he made the grand final with the Broncos against the Cowboys, that was his first ever grand final loss. So he, I think he'd won yes. like six grand finals or seven grand finals and... Yeah, he's never and never lost one until that 2015 Grand Final. Yeah, you're right. And uh, to lose that one was kind of bittersweet because, yeah, he would have loved to have kept that record intact. But seven premierships, seven you know, campaigns with players from November to October to be able to get them right, to keep them off the piss, to keep them happy, to keep them injury-free, uh, to be able to do that seven times and shows how great he is at a coach. How different yeah, is the coaching between uh, Ivan Cleary and, and Wayne Bennett? Obviously, 2010, that premiership year, is, is one of your best. And a lot of people, when I speak about your career, they think that 2014 at the Panthers was your best. And I don't know what you think, but I want to know, Penrith made the top four, which is what you set as a, a realistic goal, if you like, in rugby league whereas your main goal and what you want the most is a premiership. So how does the coaching work between Ivan Cleary and Wayne Bennett, in your opinion, and who who was a better leader? Uh, Wayne, he's... Um, yeah, the thing with both those guys is, you know, they, they have their certain um, sort of principles that they stick to and not really overly game planning in terms of tactically, uh, but certainly Wayne, you know, that man-manager role that he was, has been in for so long, being able to... Yeah, sense when someone's down and, and not sort of pick on them or anything like that. Um, Ivan's still relatively, I think he's been around for 10 years now, but in terms of you know getting to the big stage, 
Um, yeah, that year in, in 2014, we probably surprised a lot of people and we thought it was you know, going to be success for a long time. But, you know, I had some stuff going on off field and I, I probably related a lot better to, to Wayne who, um, you know, knew when to cuddle me but also knew when to fire me up. And other coaches, you know, including Ivan at certain stages probably, you know, certain things were going on that he didn't know about and, and other things were, were happening that, um, you know, probably affected that so uh wayne certainly was um you know more hands-on in terms of that stuff and that's why he probably ended up getting the best out of me i'd say do you feel wayne bennett has the like the total respect of players that play underneath him do you think it's just another level of respect for him where everyone knows kind of when to shut up and kind of things like that yeah definitely uh, you know and that's probably when you win seven chips it's uh <laughs> you can pretty yeah. much tell everyone what to do whenever but uh, when you've done it for so long as well and so many different characters you only have to think back like when wendell was at the dragons manage wendell and keep beat yeah. but also keep wendell being wendell is important to the group you know you don't he doesn't make you feel like you have to change to fit into the group and you know i've had other coaches that didn't like the the loud people or didn't like the the way things were going on and tried to beat that out of them and, and try to change the whole culture of the of the locker room too much and, and you know the locker room separate the players need to dictate that and, and sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't Jamie I want to ask you about your I want to ask you about your premiership in 2010 obviously this is a, a peak moment of your uh, of your career and, and I 100% assume your life you know that's something that literally you know, thousands and thousands of, of, of young guys uh, aim to dream about when they're a young kid just playing around the, the, back, the backyard and just throwing the ball around and, and you actually achieve that. Please run us through kind of, you know, we all know that that photo of you where you're just, you know, in absolute tribulation when you've just won the premiership. Yeah, it was tough because 09, I thought, you know, this is going to be my childhood dream. I went to sleep about a month out. You know, we'd, we were minor premiers that, that year and, we win the last game, last game of the round, as uh, round of the season, 37 nil. Then all of a sudden, we get bowled out in straight sets, and I didn't know if I'd ever get back to that situation again because I'd had a pretty successful year individually as part of the team. Uh, and then 2010 rolled around, same sort of thing. You know, we, we got back to that moment, and um, the clutch sort of moments leading into that Tigers game was we're so close, but we're so far away. Uh, so once we got past there, I felt like. No disrespect to the Roosters, but I felt like the game against the Tigers was the grand final, and whoever won that was just going to be too good for for the other team, being the Titans or the Roosters. And uh, it was it was the grand final was just an amazing experience. Um, you know, it's the whole week is rushed. You, know, you try and switch off as much as you can to get to the game, and, and once the game sort of rolled around, you knew that. Yeah, it was on. It was. It's. Uh, it's. It's a moment that you wish you could relive uh, over and over again. But that that moment of running out uh, and then, you know, at the end, being able to celebrate with your teammate happens very quickly because, yeah, you know, for something that you've waited your whole life for to be over in five days, um, yeah, essentially in five days, is is something that you know is I guess you look back and you wish you could celebrate forever. But. Um, yeah, we haven't had a reunion yet of the players. We're doing that later this year. So uh, it would be really the first time, you know, because in 2011, you're trying to defend your title. You're on a plane trip to England to prove you're the best team in the world, club team, and then you're back and you're into it again. So there was no real time to sit down and reflect as a team uh, because you're always thinking about what was next. And that's what makes the Roosters so good. They were able to sit down, reflect for a little bit, come back and do it back to back, and now they have a chance in three people. When you speak about reflection, was it a lesson learned coming back from, and you spoke about how good the Titans were. It's a good example that you brought up the Titans in that year. And you came off that big 2019 season. It didn't go the way you wanted it to go, unfortunately. But was it a lesson learned losing to the Titans and the Broncos after having a good season and then going on to win a premiership was their ref reflection not just with you but for the entire club in that moment yeah it was i think uh it was the eels because it was part of the hain plane um that oh, okay. like, yeah. no yeah. stop it get yeah. it down mate get it up get off it. <laughs> yeah look uh losing that one hurt uh, i think we we're embarrassed and then you know to get bowled out straight sets is a certain level of embarrassment that comes back to that so uh, 2010 was just different. You know, Wayne Bennett spoke about 
we're not going to change anything. We just need to do it better. And, and that was the message driven by the senior players and Dean Young, Ben Hornby, uh, Matt Cooper. All those guys believed that we were good enough. We just didn't do it at the right time. So a lot of our stuff going into 2010, if you watch the similarities between 2009 to, and 2010, we're all the same. And uh, we just, you know, we kept shifting left. We kept having Darius out the back. BMOS scored a, a thousand tries again. It was all pretty much similar. We just needed to do it at the right time of, of the year. And luckily for us, you know, defensively, we're a great team. I think we only averaged 11 points a game, which is one of the lowest. Wow. That's, uh, you that's know, good. in a premiership winning season. Insane, yeah. And to be able to do that and back it up, it, it gave us great confidence. So uh, the, the disappointment of 09 was quickly overshadowed by, right, uh, we don't, let's, how do we not make this happen again and, and fast forward to pre-season and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, 12 months on, we're the champs. So would that be, the, would that be your overcoming adversity moment? Would that, would that like, like you've been saying, would that be the moment where you guys realise we need to take it to the next level? Is that your facing adversity moment that everyone faces no matter what they do? Is that the one moment? Yeah, so like the two bits probably adversity-wise um, in my career, you know, as a team, definitely 2009, we needed to overcome that whole embarrassment and, and getting back to, you know, being there and being in the moment and, and living that rather than expecting it to happen probably. And I felt like we were ready from day one. You know, 2009, we're a bit of unknown commodity. We, Wayne was there. We had a great coach. Did we have the best team? Probably not. But, you know, we really worked our asses off to be a great team together. So... Um, you know, everyone faces all sorts of kind of adversity, but uh, certainly as a Dragons team, 2009 when we lost uh, to the Broncos was was that changing point. And now I, I want to ask you about obviously your days with New South Wales. Uh, that obviously, you know, it, it is a dream in itself as well, playing for New South Wales. But you played in an incredibly, incredibly difficult period that uh, Queensland were obviously, you know, the most the difficult period. <laughs> You know, I, I'm a Queensland fan, so I, I'm not too sure about how, you know, everyone on New South Wales is feeling. I'd love to get a, an in-depth look into how the players were feeling because, you know, you guys you still had a good team. You still had the best team that New South Wales could put on the field, but it's just Queensland had immortals on their team. Like, it was just, it was it was surreal. What, what are your thoughts on, on that when you were playing and, and having to go up against a team like that? <laughs> um, I, it was funny because... You know, I uh, talked about this a little bit. I don't talk about State of Origin too much because we lost the series. I don't believe that you should talk about, you know, you're proud to play for New South Wales, but, you know, we lost the series. So it mean, doesn't mean anything to me in terms of that whole series. I'm proud to be a New South Welshman and go for New South Wales and all that, but I don't talk about much because we lost. Going up against JT and Lockie that year, Piercy and I really didn't have anything to lose. You know, we were going out there. Yeah. They were dominant for so long. People ask, you know, how was that Origin experience? And when you look back, I did not wasn't at the time, but now that you look back, uh, you know, nearly 10 years on, when Smith passed the ball to Thurston, he passed it to Lockyer, he passed it <laughs> off to Inglis, turned the ball inside to Slater, and then he picked up Cronk. You can see why they won. <laughs> it's madness, man. It really is just madness. That's what, well, that's what I was saying. Like, you know, was there was there like a, a lingering, a, like, did you when you you just said that you had nothing to lose? Was there a lingering feeling like they're unbeatable? Or did you actually, like, did you and Piercy go into those games and, and think, you know what, we, we genuinely have a chance here? Or was there that feeling? No, no, you, I, I'm ultra competitive, so everyone's always got a chance, um, no matter what yeah, the yeah, fight. Exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look back at that series, we lead 12 10 with seven to go uh, in game one. You know, we, we make a wrong option, kick an early, Slater tracks it down, comes back up the other end, inside ball off Lockie, scores. We lose 16-12, we win the game 2-18-8. Uh, it comes down to a decider, so we weren't far away um, in terms happened. of winning that series. But uh, when it came crunch time, that first 20 in game three, they blew us off the park and we lose 34-24. Yeah, it, it, it is tough, but at the like you said, man, as the fact is, is that you still played for your state and that is an absolute peak. So despite the actual end result, it is definitely something to still be proud of. Yeah, definitely. I always, um, I'm a traditionalist. I was raised, you know, watching New South Wales on a Wednesday night with hot dogs and you know, my stepdad, you know, we'd sit up and watch and he always talked about, you know, how proud a moment it must be to represent your state in this cauldron. It's the, the toughest, you know, series in the world in terms of any kind of sporting event where physically for six weeks, you have to not only play club level, but also play origin. 
and that's what the the best players do so uh, making my debut at Suncorp was awesome <laughs> to be able to run out there and you know the Queenslanders wanting, wanting blood and um, you know while we didn't get the result always be uh, proud to say that I played Origin and I was lucky enough to debut in the stadium that I'd watched so many Origins growing up. Now I want to ask you about the difference between club and state in regards to training. So you said before that you weren't actually the best you weren't actually the best trainer when it was actually during the uh, during the seasons. Uh, but what was there was there a major difference between the actual you know training of club to, to state level or was there, it basically quite similar? Uh, well by the time Origin runs around you've been training for six months already so um, your yep. body's ready to go playing wise it's all about getting ready for that result so there's not too much taxing stuff in terms of state of origin camps pre-season's the hardest thing you'll do because you know that if you haven't won the year before or you haven't been sort of successful um, you've got to train harder to be able to get back to that spot or, or go go again so pre-season you know is a long slog four months no games a lot of running a lot of uh, breaking the body right down and, and that physical and mental exhaustion that you need to keep training to come back. And, yeah, the players get paid great for it, but I think, you know, in 20 years' time, we're going to look back and say that we probably got our training all wrong, that, you know, we're asking guys, we're the only sort of us and AFL are the only teams that have four-month pre-seasons. You know, NFL have like 60 days and it's all about getting them ready for the game whereas we like to break our bodies right down and everyone comes out stronger fitter faster but um yeah we have 26 games to get ready for so the, the science behind what goes into a, a season you know, to get your body ready to be able to play origin if you camp smith 30 40 odd times <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. it, a lot goes into it but yeah the training in origin was awesome you'd actually the first two days you'd actually go out on the piss because there's nothing to do. You don't have to play for another eight <laughs> days. So you can go out and, yeah. yeah, we do a function with, I think we did a function with Barry O'Farrell, who was a premier, and then uh, oh. on the way home, the uh, Sticky and the crew had organised place for us to drop in and have a beer, and uh, we didn't have training the next day, so I think we got on it again, and then all of a sudden it was, after that, you knew that the camp was on, so it was good. I was going to say, where do you find yourself most successful in your career? You can argue, as you said, being the surprise packet of 2014, the Premiership in 2010. Where did you see yourself finding that, that success? Like I said, 2009 individually. Um, I think I finished four points off of Dally M. You know, that was one of the seasons, probably my best season individually. Um, you keep showing me the para jersey, but they haven't won one in like 30 <laughs> <laughs> Put him in his place. Put him in his place. I love it. <laughs> I mean, people Jared, always say, oh, you know, dragon this and dragon that. Like, well, at least I've got a ring, so. <laughs> I'm actually, on that, just on that, I've seen an art. I saw an article. I remember when Bo Ryan, I remember when Bo Ryan yes, did I remember with this. your face on the cat and you said something about, like, uh, I'll sh show me yours and I'll show you mine when you were holding up the premiership trophy. And obviously, Bo Ryan doesn't have one. <laughs> See, the thing about Bo is I, I don't really know him. Uh, he was at, left the Dragons by the time I'd gotten there, and um, I just felt disrespected that I, I wasn't mate to them. You know, I, I, yeah, yeah. I don't mind getting the piss taken out of me, but there's a certain level of respect that needed to happen, and he was early on in his media career, and I felt like he was using me as a stepping stone to make fun of me to provide content, mm. and I wasn't for that. So, um, yeah, the whole show me yours and show you mine... Um, it's the easiest comeback. You know, players will always say, how many games have you played? Well, when you win a ring, you can sit down at functions and that's why I always wear it out at, at sportsman's lunches because there's always <laughs> one wanker that wants to... Yeah, like we've, got, like we've got in this podcast, there's always one wanker that wants to try you on. About, you know, <laughs> yeah, let them know. Shirts and stuff like that, but I just, uh, I just I can't hear the rings talking too loud. For, um, yeah, for someone it. you got the better of definitely was... Actually, your old team, the Roosters, you actually uh, won quite a few games against them. What was it like playing your old club and actually just getting the best of them at most times, kicking field goals, winning a premiership against them? What was that kind of like? Is, was that good to savour when you beat your old club kind of thing? Um, yes. See, I didn't really see the Roosters as my old club because I'd only played 20-odd games there and okay. never really got an opportunity to cement that spot or never really took it. So. Yeah. Um, when I left the Dragons, that was like, yeah, breaking up with your ex and wanting to beat the shit out of them. So I took yeah. that really personally. I felt disrespected from the Dragons um, that I wasn't offered a longer deal and, you know, got four yeah. four years out west and 
you know, that disrespect after winning the Premiership, you know, I felt like they could have had me and Whittup in the halves and they decided to go a different way for whatever reason. Yeah. Then they changed coach. So, yeah, playing the Roosters was always, you know, I had a good run. I think I only lost once in, in seven years or something like that. Um, but, yeah, playing against the Dragons, we beat them once and they beat me once um, or, or two times or something. But, uh, yeah, I, I never really saw the Roosters. My old club it was always um, sort of very fired up when I played the Dragons when I was playing for Penrith. A lot of players obviously find a lot of attachment with their old club. You've, you've, you felt disrespected by the Dragons, so do you have a t- club? Or do you support the Panthers or do you just not support anyone right now? No, I'm a neutral. Um, I, obviously, the Dragons premiership year, you know, is 10 years ago, so there's always a soft spot there for the people that were involved and stuff like that, but uh, in terms of supporting anyone, I can't support anyone and then do the power rankings because people would get their knickers in a knot. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I just like watching. I like watching the the young talent coming through in Canterbury Cup, which I commentate on. Yeah. Uh, on the Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then also watching that translate into the elite players in our game. One question I definitely want to ask you is about your runner. I found it so fascinating it. how mentally is it more of a mental thing where you run up like there there always be commentary talking about. I thought. But he just keeps kicking them. Like, is there is there someone that taught you a certain process? Because uh, Kalen Pong has changed his run up, and it's almost like a stutter run up. It's it's almost counterproductive the way he runs up. Yours was very specific. You tap your boots, you do the march, and then you just bang him in. Was there something or someone that went, "This is how you got to kick a goal"? What was like the kind of the process? Because I always found that so yeah fascinating from a fan standpoint yeah so I get asked about it a lot yep for me I wasn't a great goal kicker I mean through the juniors you know we scored a lot near the post so that was cool but I wasn't a great <laughs> um, goal kicker uh, until I went to the Dragons and I really struggled that sort of first year and then Kurt Wrigley the assistant coach uh, got me to go and work with Graham Arnold who's a soccer coach oh, yep, yep. at Cogra yep. and uh, at the time I was doing the Johnny Wilkinson I tried different things different stances and you know David Beckham doesn't bend over to walk in uh, to go into a free kick and I was like oh yeah and that's always stuck with me you know so regardless of working on shoulder angles and stuff like that he just showed me that um, movement into the ball was always important for me in my terms to be able to move in and strike the ball so uh, I have no idea where the march came from but uh, the, the seven steps back the kick in the boots it was all part of the routine to like a golf swing yep. to try and emulate that time after time and um, you know my goal kicking percentage certainly improved after working with Graham just that the other sporting codes that focus on kicking has really helped NRL like does that happen often where they will bring in other people like I've heard like with wrestling coaches and the Rabbitohs and how they tackle it brought in a lot of wrestling and judo based people is does that happen often behind the scenes where they bring in specialists from other sports that kind of translates into footy I think it's like Daryl Halligan's the main guy that everyone usually works with yeah Uh, he gets around but even he warms up with a soccer ball like it's all about goal kicking you have to want to do You, you can't just be good at it you have to want to do you have to want to you know, do 40 kicks every session, two sessions a week, maybe for two kicks on the weekend. You know, that's yeah. you know, times 80. Yeah. 80 kicks times, what, you know, 40, 50 weeks. Yeah, it's a lot of kicking for uh, maybe 200 kicks a year, maybe less, maybe 100 kicks a year. So you have to really want to do it. You have to be disciplined with what you're doing. You have to have a structure of what you're doing and a plan to work out. So um, I've always found that the kids that I work with and the goal kickers you know I ask them if they kick goals and like yes and they want to go straight out to the sideline you know they they don't understand the basis of that whole technique of doing the little things right so goal kicking has specialist coach uh, wrestling has you know certain judo and all those kind of guys have come in but um, sometimes they overcomplicate. I hated those sessions because I was always going to get the shit beat out of me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather goal kick. I'm going to move into kind of uh, a little bit back to the game itself. Uh, let's remove this current situation right now. Uh, it's been talked about for a few years that there could be uh, expansion. Let's think of this in a perfect world. And I want to ask you, do you, who do you think would be the most realistic option? Or if there could be two teams, uh, who is the most reali- re- realistic option for expansion? I would say Brisbane, definitely. And potentially New Zealand. 
I would love New Zealand. I, I love that you've said New Zealand because I feel like a, a second New Zealand, like a North Island and a South Island team, would just be unbelievable rivalry wise. Uh, but Brisbane confuses me a little bit. Yeah, well, the thing with Brisbane is a lot of people say, like, Bron- Broncos get 50,000 every second week. Um, that stadium deserves 40, 50,000 every week. So that's why you bring two teams into Brisbane. Plus the, the talent wise, you know, in and around those areas with Kiba Park and all those high schools and stuff. They could definitely get that up and running and, and have a lot of local juniors come through, uh, whether it be the Titans move there and they look for somewhere else. Um, but New Zealand Warriors, to me, uh, they have a whole country there and they haven't been able to produce the quality and talent that they should. So maybe branching out a little bit down to the south or, or north and splitting them up, whatever you want to do. But that country is too talented with rugby union players and people that have grown up with league and union not to have two teams. Jamie, do you think it would be yeah, good to have a Central Coast it. Bears team with the, the Central Coast Stadium being used probably only twice a year now, but the, the game and the crowds always turn up, especially the Roosters and the Cowboys last year. That was close to a sellout and it was a good game, but do you think it would be a good move to have a Central Coast team? I'm from the coast myself, so I wanted to know yeah. your perspective. That. Well, I think it's tough because you got nine teams in Sydney. You know, if they relocated a team, then it probably okay. makes it a lot easier to stomach. But uh, the thing with relocation or, or, you know, putting another franchise in, it has to be successful. Um, no disrespect to the Titans, but, you know, two finals appearance or three finals appearance in 13 years isn't going to cut it when bringing fans back to the game. And whilst they, they've got financial security, we need to look at how we can get people through the gates and, and being successful so just putting a team on the central coast or Brisbane or New Zealand doesn't automatically guarantee success the Warriors are still waiting for their first title um, you know Parramatta haven't won one in 35 years uh, you know there's a lot of teams that crave success that need to put things in place to be able to do that so um, I just don't think central coast if, if I could choose I'd have Brisbane I think Brisbane needs a second team even if you kept the Titans whatever but yeah if, in a perfect world I'd have Brisbane and New Zealand I definitely I definitely agree with the New Zealand one I think they just bring a whole nother level to the game uh, it, but even though they haven't the, the Warriors obviously haven't specifically won them won themselves yet uh, but I definitely I, I agree with that and I can understand your reasoning behind Brisbane too I don't know if we should I am a Titans fan, so you know I don't want the Titans to leave. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just think giving up the Gold Coast to say the AFL is probably a, a difficult option because that would just open up for the for the Suns to, to, to have that entire market. Yeah, definitely. And you know, it, the, the talent question always comes into it. You know, why don't we go to Perth? Well, we gave Perth the nines and they didn't turn up. So um, there's yep. got to be a lot of planning and everything that goes into putting another team on the map. Okay, lastly, we've been going for about an hour now, so we'll kind of start to wrap things up. But Jamie, I want to ask you, what's uh, what's your plans for the future, mate? Like, what are you what what are your uh, ideal plans for the for the future? Yeah, just continue to grow the podcast. I love doing uh, all these kinds of things and interviews and listening to people tell their stories and and enjoy that. But um, you yeah, know, Brecky Radio or Afternoon Radio would be probably a dream, and still be able to commentate on the weekends. So. Uh, it's about enjoying the life balance that I have at the moment. You know, I work pretty hard during that sort of rugby league season, uh, months of the season. So getting finding that balance, continue to be a uh, good husband and good father, and the rest will fall into place. Well, look, mate, I think you, you know you're a fantastic bloke, and we really appreciate you coming on here. You know, I, I'm really happy that you're still active in the community. Uh, you're still providing your opinion. You know, people want to hear the players' opinions. And, and despite the fact that you're not playing anymore, you have that experience, uh, you have that knowledge. And, and as we, we've found out today, like you, you have an absolute passion for the game too. So um, it is really good to, to, to see you active in the community as you are. Thanks, boys. I appreciate you having me. And uh, you can go and get rid of that Parramatta shirt now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying that for a long time. <laughs> but yeah, now we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here though, boys. So yeah, Jamie Sour, thanks for coming on. Uh, we've put all his social medias uh, and obviously Sweet and Sour, definitely go and check that one out if you're a massive sports fan, especially American sports as well. He, he delves into all of that. Thank you to Hayden Entertain House and Luke Schultz for coming on as per usual. Cheers, good podcast, Jamie. I liked it. Very good. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, yeah, thank you, boys. Very good. Obviously, guys, if you're not subscribed uh, to Big Our Sport yet, what are you doing? Go down there, hit the subscribe button, join the Beak Army, and also hit the little ding ling notification bell so you can get a notification every time we upload. have just created an In The Sheds Instagram page where we're going to be giving you the latest big news and also we're going to be giving you clues as to who's the next guest on. That will do us today, guys. So thanks for watching. Catch you later. See ya.